Hey everyone, welcome to chapter 18. Uh, this week's lecture is going to focus on the gram positive and gram negative cocci of medical importance. So we're going to focus primarily on the spherical bacteria today. Uh, our last chapter, which we get into on diseases, dealt with the uh, bacilli. And uh, we will come back to the bacilli again to look at the uh, gram negative bacilli. Um, however, we are going to get into talking about the cocci and group both the gram positives and gram negatives together. As we get into this chapter, we're going to talk primarily about three major groups today the Staphylococci, the Streptococci, and the Neisseria. Uh, and then we will sprinkle in some other uh, less significant. Um, microorganisms in there, but those are the three major groups that we're going to get into. Again, as you are preparing and you're studying for the chapters, it's really important for you to set yourself up some type of a grid or a data table that you can fill in as you're going through the lectures. <clears throat> I would primarily put the causative agent, so what the actual microbe's name is. I would put the disease. I would put the symptoms and any type of significant test that is associated with it. So we're gonna talk about some different virulence factors and different tests today that are important to uh, keep track of as we go through these microbes. So we're gonna start first today with the Staphylococci and talk specifically about some of the overall characteristics of this genus. These are commonly found on the skin, uh, areas like the nares around the nostrils and in the mucous membranes. And again, since they're known as the staphylococci, staph implies that they're clusters of cells, and in this case, they're clusters of cocci or spheres. These are all gram positive, and they do not have any flagella or the capability to produce spores. And there's over 31 different species that fall into this particular genus. Some of them do have the ability to produce uh, capsules as a uh, protective agent from phagocytosis, so resisting those white blood cells, those macrophages and neutrophils from being able to ingest and destroy them. So again, here's kind of an overall picture. Again, we have these nice uh, circular cells that are in these clusters or groups. And again, you'll notice that gram staining wise, they're purple, which indicates to us the gram positive reaction for the gram staining. Uh, table 18.1 in your book does give you an overview of many of the different organisms that we're going to talk about today, aligned to the particular disease of the body system that they are responsible for. So that's a good little overview chapter table if you need to refer back to it at any point. We are obviously going to talk about all of these in much greater detail today. So the first organism that we're going to dive into as we look at the Staphylococcus is we're going to look at the species Staphylococcus aureus. And Staphylococcus aureus produces these very large kind of white colonies when they're grown on a Petri dish. And you're also going to notice when we grow them on the Petri dish, we get these zones and these clearings that form. So this is actually, this particular plate is what we call blood auger. So it's basically blood cells uh, that the microbes can use, things like heme, the iron components, as the nutrient source. They prefer a uh, optimum growth temperature around that of body temperature, which makes sense because we find these primarily associated around the uh, nares carried on the nares, and they're facultative anaerobes, meaning that they are able to grow in the absence of oxygen, and they are also able to grow in the presence of oxygen. However, they do not necessarily have to use it, and they produce many virulence factors. And I will say, as a preface, it's really important for you to understand and know what the various toxins and enzymes that these microorganisms use as virulence factors do to the host cell. That's gonna be something that you will see on our third exam in the course. 
So this is a really important table. Uh, we will touch on a lot of these today, but this is definitely something that you want to make sure that you understand these various enzymes. Uh, anytime you're dealing with an enzyme, it ends with the suffix ace. So that tells you that you're dealing with an enzyme. Uh, so I would make sure that you know the name and what the effect is on the host cell. So let's talk about the pathogenesis of Staphylococcus aureus. Well, first thing first, uh, they do cause not only skin conditions, but they also are responsible for food intoxications as well. They can be isolated from fomites, and as we mentioned, they are carried on the human body, mostly around the nares, also sometimes on the skin. And you can be predisposed to infections from things like poor hygiene and nutrition to existing infections and diabetes. These microbes can easily become resistant to antimicrobials. And one of them, one of the particular antibiotics that they can become resistant to falls in that cell wall group known as methicillin. And you'll often get these very, very rigorous infections known as MRSA. And MRSA basically means methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So this is a community acquired infection. And as I mentioned, it's often very difficult to treat. There is a variety of localized and systemic infections that result from infection by Staphylococcus aureus. So you can often see things like furuncles, which are these pustules that can develop in hair follicles and glands. Um, we also can see abscesses, and an abscess is basically where you get a buildup of bacteria and then uh, accumulation of phagocytes and white blood cells, which produce this uh, pus that forms in that particular region. We also see things like folliculitis, okay? So these inflamed papules or pustules that form on the surface of the skin. Again, all resulting from Staphylococcus aureus infection. So again, this walks you through some of the key localized infections that are impacting the wounds, follicles, and glands. So we mentioned things like folliculitis, which is this inflammation of the hair follicle, usually very asymptomatic. Furuncles are also known as boils, and this is where the hair follicle becomes inflamed and actually can progress into an abscess or pustule. A carbuncle is a much deeper lesion, and this is basically where you get a bunch of these uh, furuncles that cluster together and connect forming a much larger lesion. And then we also have something known as impetigo. And impetigo is this bubble-like swelling where you get these yellow, crusty scabs that form. Uh, and it's very common in young children, especially newborns. We also mentioned that they can go from localized to much more systemic or deep-seated infections. Things like osteomyelitis, which basically causes abscesses in the uh, metaphysis of the bone. And bacteremia, and remember from earlier chapters, whenever we see this emia, that means that it is now spread in the blood. So bacteria spreading in the blood can actually get to the heart and cause a condition known as endocarditis. We mentioned that we can also have a uh, toxigenic disease, and there are several different types of toxigenic diseases that we're going to talk about. Um, we mentioned that obviously one of the things that can happen is the presence of an enterotoxin. And remember, enterotoxins are digestive toxins, and this causes that food intoxication. So you get this toxin that's able to survive high temperatures. And it's acquired from food products, things like ham, cream pastries, also processed meats are a good source of the food intoxication. 
Now, once that food is left outside of the refrigeration and becomes contaminated, the organisms can actually grow very quickly, releasing more toxins. So the symptoms are often very quick on consumption. Um, we also have what's known as SSS or scalded skin syndrome. And this is where you get this uh, bright red flushed signs to the, um, to the skin and this desquamation, there's a toxin that's actually produced that causes shedding of the external layer of the skin. Looked almost like a very, very bad sunburn, uh, except there's blisters that can form, and it's often extremely painful and fatal for very young children. Toxic shock syndrome, or TSS, comes from an enterotoxin. So this is a gram-negative toxin, remember that. When that outer membrane breaks down, pieces of that membrane can actually become a toxin in the body. And this often results in things like red rashes, muscle cramps, diarrhea, and even a drop in blood pressure. However, if it's left for an untreated state of time, it can actually cause shock and even organ failure to occur. Um, Super antigens are often uh, occurring because of this infection, and it can actually lead to things like kidney failure as a result. We do have some other very important members of the Staphylococci family. These are known as the coagulase negative. So one of the big things that differentiates certain Staphylococci from other Staphylococci is the presence of this coagulase enzyme, which is able to help break down clots. A lot of these are oftentimes nosocomial or opportunistic infections that we see with patients who, whose immune systems are compromised. We have things like Staphylococcus epidermidis, and this is one that is often found associated at infected IV catheter sites. So it's, it's an etiological agent that is often from an endogenous source, meaning that it's an organism that is growing on the body somewhere and is often introduced to a site that it normally doesn't reside in. So it's coagulase negative, endogenous, and results in a bunch of different infections such as endocarditis and UTIs as well. Staphylococcus hominis is associated with the sweat glands. Staphylococcus capitis is located on the scalp, uh, the face, and the external air. And all three of these, if there is a break to the skin, can actually get in and cause wound infections. We also have Staphylococcus saprophyticus, which is known to cause urinary tract infections in young adults and adolescents. So how do we identify Staphylococci species? Well, oftentimes we take tissue exudates, we take pus samples, sputum, urine, or blood, and we do a what's called a catalase test. This is probably the most important one. Catalase tests are going to tell us whether we have a Staphylococcus or a Streptococcus. That is very important to know. So catalase testing, tells us whether we have a uh, Staphylococcus or a Streptococcus. And coagulase testing is gonna tell us whether we have a Staphylococcus aureus species or if we have other Staphylococci species. Remember that the coagulase test is gonna help us to differentiate out if we're dealing with Staph aureus versus some of these other Staphylococci species. The catalase test is going to tell us whether we have a staph or a strep. We've talked about MRSA. We mentioned that, again, MRSA is a community-acquired infection that's a resultant from a resistant form of Staphylococcus aureus. About 95% of staphylococcal species have the enzyme penicillinase, 
And if you remember, enzymes like penicillinase can break down the uh, beta-lactam ring structure in penicillins. So most of the staphylococci are resistant to antibiotics like penicillin and ampicillin. Most abscesses have to be perforated to allow them to drain. And again, if it's untreated and becomes systemic, these often require much more lengthy and rigorous therapies. So when we treat Staphylococcus aureus, the resistant forms are often treated with things like the sulfur drugs, the tetracyclines, which target protein synthesis, MRSA, we often use vancomycin, and you have to be really careful with vancomycin because bacteria can also develop what's called VREs or vancomycin resistant enterococci. So there is some resistance that can form as a result of vancomycin treatment. Um, usually it's a synergistic effect when we use antimicrobials to treat MRSA, which means rather than using one, we often use two or more. And that is to that combination of drugs has a greater effect than each one individually. Universal precautions, as we've talked about, those passive carriers, we want to make sure in the hospital setting that we're having as little of the passive carrier route as possible. Hygiene and cleansing are extremely important as well. Now we're going to move on and start talking about the streptococci. And the streptococci, again, strepto means chains. So now we're going from the clusters, like we saw with the staphylococci, to the chains with the streptococci. Again, also gram positive. And most of these do not form spores or are, are moving or motile as well. One of the big virulence factors is they can produce capsules which protects them from phagocytosis. They are facultative anaerobes. And as we mentioned, one of the big differences uh, testing-wise from the staphylococci is these do not form the catalase enzyme. And catalase, again, is an enzyme that is really designed to break down toxic oxygen radicals into things like oxygen gas, which is less dangerous for microbes. These are fastidious. They often require enriched media to grow them. And they are extremely resistant to things like drying, heat, and certain disinfectants as well. So here's our chains of cocci. Again, very different looking from the staff. Still gram positive, staining purple in color. There is a scientist whose name was Rebecca Lansfield. And she developed a grouping system that identifies the carbohydrates of streptococcin. And this is the primary way that we classify streptococci into the various 17 group system. We can also classify them based on their level of what we call hemolysis. And that's the breakdown of red blood cells. So you'll notice that we have alpha hemolysis, which is an incomplete breakdown of blood cells. You'll notice that here that you get a little bit of a halo, but not much. These are members of the Streptococcus pneumoniae group and also the Viridin Streptococci group. The other groups that fit in uh, to the Streptococci genera are the beta hemolytic, meaning that there is a complete breakdown or lysis of the red blood cells. And these are groups like the A, B, C, G, and some of the D group fit into this category. The group A strep, I will point out, include things like Streptococcus pyogenes. Uh, Streptococcus pyogenes is sensitive to the antibiotic bacitracin. The group B and C strep are resistant to bacitracin. And then we also have the streptomoniae, which are their own group, and the viridins streptococci, which are their own group. And you can see that the A, B, and C group fall into the beta hemolytic category, 
and then streptococci pneumoniae and uh, the viridins group fit into that alpha hemolytic group. So again, this will give you kind of an overview of a lot of the ones that we are going to get into and talk about. So let's start first looking at the beta hemolytic strep, specifically streptococcus pyogenes. We've already mentioned that this is a member of the group A streptococci family, and they are differentiated by the presence of what we call the A carbohydrate in their cell wall. So that's just the letter A. These are strict parasites, and they typically inhabit the throat or the nasal pharynx region. They produce a slew of different antigens and virulence factors that are responsible for their ability to cause infection and disease. We have what are called the C carbohydrates, and these protect against an enzyme known as lysozyme. It's actually in your tears, it's a component in your tears and it's actually able to break down microbial cells. Remember that the fimbriae, those bristle-like projections, allow the microbe to adhere to surfaces and other cells. The M protein, which is incredibly important, is able to prevent phagocytosis. Um, it protects not only against from phagocytosis, but also assists in adherence as well. They do have a capsule, and the capsule is made of hyaluronic acid. And since it's made of a common component in human tissues, not only does this not uh, inject a immune response or cause an immune response to happen, but it prevents from being phagocytosed. We also have something known as the C5A protease which is going to hinder a immune response known as the complement system and actually impacts the ability for your white blood cells, the neutrophils, to respond and destroy the infection. There's also two other proteins that I'll mention here, protein F and protein G. Protein F is able to bind to a fibronectin and uh, the protein G is a cell wall protein. Those are two other uh, components of uh, Streptococcus pyogenes virulence factors. They also produce several toxins as well. So we have the streptolysins, and these are able to cause not only cell but tissue damage. The erythrogenic toxin is going to induce things like fever. We call that a pyrogenic response and also stimulates a red rash to occur. And as we've already mentioned, we talked about with Staphylococcus aureus, a lot of those can be super antigens, just like the Streptococcus pyogenes. And these cause a massive influx of immune cells and result in large scale tissue damage. Finally, they can also produce enzymes. So we talk about things like streptokinase, which is able to digest clots. Hyaluronidase is an enzyme that's able to disrupt connective tissue, allowing for the microbe to spread. And then obviously DNA can actually hydrolyze host cell DNA. So there is a extremely, uh, predic uh, extremely large predicament and the fact that these microbes can cause massive damage and are able to disrupt cellular function. So humans are the only reservoir when we talk about Streptococcus pyogenes. And the transmission can happen through things like contact, droplets, or even food, usually acquired through either the skin or the pharynx. And children are really the predominant group for most of the cutaneous and throat infection. Sequelae, which are kind of these uh, more prolonged secondary infections, can result if the streptococci are untreated. So we're gonna get in and start talking about the diseases now. So first of all, we mentioned with staphylococcus, we can see things like impetigo, 
Uh, streptococci can also cause a form of impetigo as well, which are those yellow crusty lesions uh, that are common in children. We also have erysipelas, which again, from these, these group A uh, streptococci can produce not only edema or swelling, but you also get the presence of this very elevated, red, very warm uh, vesicular lesion that can form on the uh, skin and spread to the deeper layers like the dermis and the subcutaneous tissues. The one we hear about the most is strep throat, which is known as pharyngitis. And when we talk about strep throat, we're often talking about uh, infections to the back of the throat. And when we talk about these infections to the back of the throat, we are often talking about these patches or pustules that we see forming in the back of the throat. We have this red inflammation and swelling that occurs. And of course, anytime there's uh, swelling, there's also pain associated with that. If these infections, impetigo, erysipelas, and strep throat go untreated, they can develop into much more uh, spread and deeper infections or sequelae as we've called them. Uh, and some of these include things like scarlet fever. Scarlet fever is associated with that erythrogenic toxin, it produces redness. And a common symptom that we see with scarlet fever is that the tongue actually becomes so bright red, it has this ripe strawberry color to it. Um, septicemia, we have bacteria that are circulating throughout the body. Pneumonia, and again, we also have a toxic shock syndrome. We saw earlier causes like, things like a rash and muscle cramps and a drop in blood pressure. Other long-term complications from the group A strep family include damage to the heart, uh, often known as rheumatic fever, where there's damage to the valves and uh, fever as well, and uh, a glomerulonephritis, which is a damage to the kidney, can actually result in kidney failure. So not treating these infections has a significant impact on uh, the overall health and disease to the body. So we're going to switch gears. We're going to leave our streptococcus pyogenes or our group A strep. And we're going to go into the group B strep. And we've seen that group B strep is extremely dangerous for pregnant females. And that's because there is such a uh, high risk of infection and death to neonates um, especially if they're able to transfer the infection. It's normally a resident of the human vagina, the pharynx, or the large intestine, and it can actually be spread either right before passage through the birth canal or during delivery. And a lot of times we see uh, infections that uh, range from uh, neonatal pneumonia, sepsis, and even meningitis, which is an inflammation of the brain and spinal cord. So females are usually screened uh, during pregnancy for uh, presence of these group B strep. The particular group B strep that we're going to talk about is known as Streptococcus agalactiae. And this is often diagnosed through a uh, test known as the CAMP test, C-A-M-P. So a positive CAMP test oftentimes will tell us the presence of Streptococcus agalactiae. Again, gram positives, they are in chains, again, by the Streptococcus, strepto meaning chain. They are catalase negative, again, since that's the distinguishing factor from Staphylococcus to Streptococcus. These are catalase negative. And uh, they do produce beta hemolysis, so they will cause complete lysis uh, when grown on blood auger, and those blood cells are lysed open. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the uh, top cause in the United States of neonatal pneumonia 
and meningitis, so damage to the lungs as well as the brain and the spinal cord. Now we transition into the group D, uh, which are known as the enterococci, and the group C and G, streptococci. So we are going to focus on one important member of this group, known as Enterococcus faecalis. And Enterococcus faecalis is a normal flora of the large intestine for humans. It is resistant to most antibiotics, or most antimicrobials it is resistant to. It is able to cause endocarditis in humans and also has been known to be a nosocomial or hospital-acquired wound infection. The groups C and G streptococci are common flora for animals, and they often result in damage to the kidneys, that glomerulonephritis, strep throat, and oftentimes the bacteremia, the circulation of bacteria in the body. So let's jump back for a second and talk about diagnosis of the group A streptococci. This is the streptococcus pyogenes. So again, it's important to, for us to cultivate and diagnose these infections early on because we saw all of the various secondary infections, things like glomerulonephritis and scarlet fever that can form if left untreated. And we are oftentimes doing a series of uh, antibody tests to examine for and determine the particular uh, species of or serotype, they often call this sero grouping, uh, that we are working with. So they look for the antibodies that are on that uh, cell wall to determine what uh, member of the streptococci family we are looking at or what group. So that's really important to make sure that you know the sero grouping. If we are talking about beta hemolytic strep, again, we have not only the CAM test, but we can also look for areas where we get this complete uh, lysing of the red blood cells. We can also test against the antibiotic bacitracin. Remember that um, the group A strep are sensitive to bacitracin, the group B are resistant. Treatment-wise, most of these, group A and group B, can be treated with penicillin. Um, enterococcal treatment usually requires a, a combined therapy, more of a synergistic effect where we're using a few different types of antimicrobial agents. And now we'll kind of transition into our alpha hemolytic group, a group that is not going to completely lyse red blood cells when grown on blood agar. And there's a whole slew here that are prevalent. We're going to talk mostly about this top one here, Streptococcus mutans, which is often uh, a normal flora member of the oral cavity associated with the gums and the teeth. And they're not very invasive. Um, most of this particular group are introduced to deeper body tissues, either through a surgical or a dental procedure. So these are often going to be opportunistic. And typically we're going to see, just like some of the other streptococci, endocarditis as a, a possible infection. So these are much more uh, numerous residents of the oral cavity. And they are, since they are the Veridins group, there's a lot of variability. These are not often groupable by the Lanfield method. They can cause things like bacteremia, meningitis, even abscesses around the tooth. And as I mentioned, the most serious infection is that endocarditis, where the bacteria actually grow on the heart lining or the valves. And uh, this is often due to the fact that biofilms, those close associations of bacteria, are growing and communicating through quorum sensing with each other. Streptococcus mutans, which we mentioned a little while ago, is able to produce those biofilms or plaque 
that can form on the surface of the teeth. And again, this is where careful uh, careful brushing is important because the as those uh, biofilms form on the surface of the teeth, they can actually degrade the enamel and cause these caries or cavities to form in the surface of the teeth. Flossing is important because if the Streptococcus mutans is able to get into the uh, surrounding gum tissue and grow, uh, it will cause prolonged inflammation and swelling, which will cause to recession of the gum line and eventually get into the bones uh, that hold the teeth in the sockets, known as periodontal disease. Now we're going to get into and talk about that other group of strep. They kind of have their own category. Uh, these are known as the pneumococcus, and it's caused by a uh, pathogenic agent known as streptococcus pneumoniae. The majority of the uh, pneumonias that we talk about are caused by streptococcus pneumoniae. And these are diplococci, meaning that they are associated in pairs, and they have a very pronounced capsule. In fact, most of the vaccine work that has been done against streptococcus pneumoniae has been targeted against the capsule. These grow on either blood auger or what's known as chocolate auger. Chocolate auger is, is significant because it actually looks like milk chocolate and it's acquired from uh, basically lacing and breaking open all of the blood cells, which causes the auger to have this chocolate appearance to it. They are also capnophiles, meaning that they want to grow in elevated carbon dioxide levels. So their growth actually improves when CO2 is elevated by between 5 and 10%. These do not have catalase. So again, if they're exposed to super oxides or oxygen, the cultures will die off. So they require that elevated CO2. We mentioned the capsules, which is their major virulence factor. And in terms of conditions, they cause a whole bunch. They are able to cause not only pneumonia and otitis media, which is a middle air infection, but they're also responsible for things like meningitis, lobar pneumonia, and also bronchial pneumonia as well. So again, we're going to see the presence of the pneumonia, about 60 to 70% of all of the pneumonias come from streptococcus pneumoniae, where you get this buildup of fluid or exudate in the uh, bronchioles but then also down deep into the lung tissue in these little uh, gaseous sacs known as the alveoli. And then we also see things like otitis media, which is impacting the uh, middle air. So about five to 50% of all people harbor this microbe as part of their normal flora in the nasal pharynx. And you don't really get pneumonia until you aspire these organisms into the deeper lung tissues. So traditionally, your deep lung tissues, your bronchi, your alveoli are sterile environments. When the uh, organisms are brought down into those deeper tissues, they can induce an overwhelming immune response, uh, causing inflammation and swelling. Uh, if we're talking about otitis media, they are gaining access to the middle air through the eustachian tube. So how do we diagnose pneumococcal infections? Well, obviously, first of all, we need to do the gram stain to figure out that they are gram-positive cocci that are diplo. Because again, your staphylococci are gonna be in groups, your streptococci are going to be in chains, your uh, streptococci pneumoniae are gonna be in uh, pairs or diplo. We also do what's known as the quelling test. And this is where we look at the capsule. Obviously, these are alpha hemolytic as well. So they are not going to completely lyse red blood cells when grown on blood auger. 
Treatment is usually penicillins. Um, we are seeing increasing drug resistance to these. And there is, as we mentioned earlier, they are developing a vaccine which is available and is more for high risk individuals, but it's targeted against that capsule. Now we're gonna move into and start talking about the gram negatives. So up to this point, the staphylococci, the streptococci, the enterococci, those are all gram positive cocci. We're now gonna transition and start talking about the gram negative cocci, specifically two very important human pathogen members, Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitis. So let's start with an overview of the genus Neisseria. These are gram negative diplococci. They produce capsules and they also have the presence of pili. And when we talk about the uh, pili, they are going to help for attachment to the mucous membranes in the host. They are able to produce catalase and break down those toxic oxygen uh, byproducts. And these are fastidious. They also require growth on complex media. So here's our diplococci again. And we often talk about it being the causative agent of an STI known as gonorrhea. And there's a few virulence factors that contribute to the uh, ability of gonorrhea to cause infections. First of all, they have fimbriae, which are able to help for attachment. And they also produce an enzyme known as IgA protease. And IgA is a common immunoglobulin that is found in your mucous membrane tracts. So the IgA protease can actually cleave or destroy those immunoglobulins. This is uh, a relatively pathogenic organism, an infectious dose of about 100 to 1,000 cells. And they don't survive really well outside the body, only about one to two hours. Strictly a human pathogen. And we often call these the gonococcus. So we talked about streptococcus pneumoniae was the pneumococcus. Neisseria gonorrhea is known as the gonococcus. Cases again, um, you know, we see spikes in these uh, over time based on uh, the availability of antibiotics. Again, you see a lot of cases from the, the mid 60s to you know, the mid to late 80s. Um, now with, you know, certain uh, strategies and mitigation factors in place, uh, contraceptives and treatments antibiotic wise, the number of cases remains relatively low in the population. For males, this often results in urethritis and inflammation of the urethra. Uh, producing a yellow discharge. In some cases of left untreated, it can cause scarring, which leads to infertility. And only about 10% of males are asymptomatic. So most males are going to be uh, symptomatic to this microorganism. Females, on the other hand, can have conditions like vaginitis, urethritis, and also an inflammation of the fallopian tubes, which is known as salpingitis. And salpingitis, if left untreated, can actually cause a pelvic inflammatory disease, which can lead to infertility or sterility. Females, unlike males, are mostly asymptomatic. So about half of all cases in females never show any signs or symptoms. Um, obviously, there's a bunch of different risk factors that contribute to infections in adults. Um, things like anal intercourse can lead to proctitis, uh, which is an inflammation of the prostate glands, uh, pharyngitis and gingivitis, if we're talking about uh, oral intercourse. Um, careless personal hygiene can cause it to uh, basically be inoculated into the eyes and cause conjunctivitis or an inflammation of the 
conjunctiva. Uh, in some cases, the gonococcus can actually enter the bloodstream and cause things like arthritis and rashes on the limbs. And rare complications can include things like meningitis and endocarditis as well. In children, we are often talking about a condition known as ophthalmia neonicorum. And this is where the infection is passed on to infants as they pass through the birth canal, leading to a extreme eye inflammation that can ultimately cause blindness. So this is often treated by a prophylaxis immediately after birth uh, with some eye drops. So here's a picture of that, that crusting that you see on the eyelids of a newborn uh, known as ophthalmia neonatorum. And when we diagnose these, obviously we're going to do gram stains. We're going to look for the gram negative diplococci as the presumptive identification. And then we're going to have to do some other tests. There are some um, antimicrobial resistance, about 20 to 30 percent of cases can actually result in resistant uh, strains. And it's a really a combined therapy. There's several different treatments that are going to be utilized. We switch gears and we start to talk about the Neisseria meningitis or the meningococcus. And these produce a slew of virulence factors as well. Things like the capsule, the fimbriae, they also produce the IgA protease, which is able to break down those uh, immunoglobulins in the mucous membranes. And they also produce endotoxins, those gram negative uh, outer membrane toxins. There's 12 strains that are, are prevalent, and they cause meningitis as the primary disease. And this was really one of the big infections that was seen in uh, dormitory outbreaks where people were living in close contact on college campuses. Back in the late 90s, there was a massive vaccination campaign against this microbe. So how does this cause disease? Well, most of the central nervous system infections occur via the bloodstream. And the strains are verified by serogrouping. And most of the meningococcal meningitis is acquired by the respiratory route. And once they are acquired by the respiratory route, they can actually attach with the pili to your mucous membranes. And what happens from there is you get this inflammation that is produced. And this inflammation actually impedes your outflow of cerebral spinal fluid or CSF. And as the CSF actually builds up, it actually pushes the brain against the skull. There's also a uh, vasodilation that occurs and this disrupts the blood brain barrier. And when this blood-brain barrier is disrupted, it causes neutrophils to actually enter into the normally um, sterile cerebral spinal fluid. There is also uh, cases where blood clots form in those really narrow capillaries, causing hypoxia and of costs, and of course cellular death. So this has a very rapid onset and extreme neurological symptoms. Um, as, it, as it does, it's going to release, as we mentioned, those endotoxins, which causes a condition known as meningococcemia. And this, again, results in those things that we we're talking about, the hemorrhaging, the vascular damage, uh, the blood clots in the capillaries, which need, leads to the necrosis of the tissues. And you actually get these uh, petechiae, uh, which look like little lesions that form on the trunk and the appendages in a number of the cases as well. This is diagnosed basically through a lumbar puncture. So they insert a uh, long needle in between your uh, vertebrae and they withdraw a sample of the cerebral spinal fluid, which should normally be clear and cell free. 
and they do a gram stain of your CSF to look for the presence of these uh, gram negative diplococci. Treatment, usually things like penicillin and cephalosporin. There is a vaccine, and this contains a lot of the antigens that are located on the capsule as the way to uh, boost immunity against this microorganism. And then lastly, we'll wrap up today. Um, not too many. Uh, these will not really show up on the exam at all. However, I do want to point them out to you. These are some of the other gram-negative cocci of importance. Um, we have Branhamella catarallis, and this is a, a common member of the nasal pharynx. It is opportunistic for patients that have cancers, diabetes, or are uh, exhibiting alcoholism. Uh, Morixella is found on the mucous membranes. And then we also have Acinetobacter, and we see Acinetobacter a lot with uh, production of certain food products. So that wraps up chapter 18. Again, if you've got questions on any of the material in the chapter, please feel free to pop into weekly office hours. Uh, make sure as a way to help you organize, there's a lot of information to keep track here. Set yourself up a table for this chapter. Go through and note your causative agent, your disease, the symptoms, and also the virulence factors that are significant for that microbe to colonize and cause infection. Thanks, everybody. Have a fantastic week and see you soon.